Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. Today, I'd like to welcome Jonathan Crowder to the show. Jonathan, how are you doing today? I'm very well. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. Jonathan, I'd like to kick the show off always with something interesting about the guests. So why don't you start off with that? Uh, well, you know, I don't think I'm probably the best place person to say why I am or I'm not interesting. Uh, you know, you're the, you were kind enough to invite me here. Um, you know, I, I sort of view how we ended up here, and maybe this is an interesting angle. I view how we ended up here as a, you know, there's the you know famous Lemony Snicket book of a series of unfortunate events. Uh, I feel like my career has largely been a series of fortunate events. Um, and just that, you know, if I hadn't been the beneficiary of, and, you know, I guess this is very much in the spirit of bigger than us, if I hadn't been the beneficiary of belief and kindness from a series of other people, I wouldn't have ended up going to SMU here in Dallas for, for my education. I wouldn't have received a, a recommendation letter from my favorite professors there that helped me have the opportunity to go work at uh, one of the most sort of pro-technology environmental policy think tanks in the country, um, in Oakland, a group called the Brick Institute. Um, when I left there, I wouldn't have had the existing relationship with the gentleman who's now my, my business partner, who was working at a, a kind of Perkins back startup in the energy industry. Um, I wouldn't have ultimately gotten that job and you know uh, been entrusted with some really important partner relationships and, and a number of other responsibilities there. And you know uh, now, if you know looking forward, we wouldn't have been entrusted with the um, with the trust that entrepreneurs place in us when we when we help support them on their journey. So uh, you know. I don't know if, if being lucky is interesting, um, but I suspect we're all fortunate in our own ways. Well, you know, I, I do think that's interesting. And, and I'll tell you why, because, you know, I am fortunate to where I have, I would say, several hundred conversations a year with different individuals. And, and every once in a while, one of them, like you, will come to me and say, Raj, you know, there was a lot of luck involved. And, you know, serendipity is another word that I love myself. And, you know, a lot of times people like to say, I did it all myself, you know, perhaps I had a small team, but the idea of how much luck does play into, you know, one's definition of success or where they are. I, I think that's really interesting that, you know, you kick off and, and start with an admission that a lot of luck played into where you are today. So I, I, I really sincerely from the bottom of my heart really appreciate that start off. I think it just helps you bring humility to your work. Um, and I mean, from my perspective, you know, I, I definitely didn't have an appreciation for this on the front side, but, uh, and, you know, I think in respect, I'm still in the zero here. And so, uh, you know, I don't want to overly forecast for the future. Looking back over the last several years, you know, I, I see the role that good fortune and uh, grace from other people has, has played. And so, you know, now looking forward, I think that we, we think in these terms as investors too, is, is that I, I know that I cannot predict the future with absolute certainty. But what I can try to do is evaluate the probabilities of various different events and put ourselves in the position that we believe has the best probability of good fortune. Um, and, you know, if I, if I look back over the, the course of my career so far, and then I look forward at, you know, what I sort of hope is the trajectory for you know, the next 50 years, um, I think that, that that's played a really key role. Um, but ultimately, you know, that, you know, even if you are in a situation with extremely high probabilities, you know, sometimes you have the 95% probability and, and you don't, and you happen to be the one in 20 where it doesn't work out the way that you want it. Um, other times you're the one in a hundred probability and you do get the role of the dice that you were looking for. Um, and so it helps you, uh, I think, one, stay sane um, and understand that there's things you can and can't control. Um, but then also have appreciation for when someone does you a kindness when they didn't have to. T totally agree. So you mentioned your current position. Um, can you explain to the audience a little bit about what you're doing right now and what you're working on? Sure. Um, so at Intel's Capital, we invest in and support entrepreneurs who are working to digitize traditionally analog industries, is the way that we, call, uh, that we think about it, with a primary focus on the energy value chain. So uh, for the purposes of you know, our investment thesis, that's mostly bookended by electricity generation, distribution, consumption, although we do think uh, a fair amount about also the primary determinants of electricity generation price. And so... To, to some extent that also goes into potential fuel sources and, and how we extract those more efficiently or whether we should be extracting them at all in some cases. Um, and so and that's that's the role today. So you mentioned um, digitizing analog. Can you give me a, like, a specific example? Yeah. So the utility industry um, has historically, in many respects, been a, a, a pen and paper or, you know, I suppose this is digital in some sense, but an Excel spreadsheet industry. Um, of course, there's reams of either possible data that has historically been uncaptured or uh, existing data, which is not 
utilized to drive operational or strategic insights. Um, and we see just tremendous opportunity to make the global energy infrastructure as a whole more efficient by deploying technology. And are there any particular companies that you can speak about right now that you really enjoy either working in or looking at from afar? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I I admire so many companies in this space, but I'm I'm happy to you know pick one in particular. Uh, so earlier this year, we were uh, fortunate to be able to invest in a company called Ensemble Energy. So Ensemble Energy uses machine learning to optimize wind turbine operations and maintenance. And so the way that you know to take a really simple example. The way that wind turbine operations and maintenance is done today in many cases is very similar to the way that you would think about doing maintenance for your car. You know, every 10,000 miles, you do an oil change. Well, maybe every six months you grease the main bearing or check the gearbox or whatever the case may be. Um, The trouble is that the wear patterns on wind turbines can be radically different depending on the direction in which the wind is blowing, the configuration of a particular fleet of assets. Um, And so that's not especially effective at preventing catastrophic failures. You know, if you're performing effective regular maintenance, maybe the annual maintenance cost for a, for a given asset is about $5,000 to $25,000 a year, depending on the, the OEM and the size of the turbine uh, and a series of other factors. But if you have a catastrophic failure, it could be $250,000 or substantially more if it's an offshore uh, it's an offshore asset where, you know, if you look at the areas where there are the most offshore assets, it's, it's largely in the north of Europe, in many cases in sections of ocean that are frozen for large parts of the year. So accessibility becomes a substantial challenge. And so if you have a a catastrophic failure in November or December, you may not actually be able to reach that asset for three, four months, depending on what the, what the ocean conditions look like. And so being able to plan maintenance and predict when failures will occur becomes substantially more important. Um, and so they take the massive streams of data that are coming off of these generation assets. And you know, wind turbines, in many cases, I think, are, are in many ways are a unique and, and interesting use case for this for the energy industry. And that it's really the first generation resource to come online after the internet revolution. And so they actually do, they are fairly well instrumented. They do have a number of sensors that uh, that spit off temperature, vibration data, um, things of that nature. Um, the trouble is, is that it's really difficult as a human being to interpret all of those various different data streams and, and what they mean in real time. Um, you know, we're at a interesting moment in history technologically in that, you know, we have this now no longer brand new concept of machine learning that enables us to take seemingly unrelated data streams of fairly massive quantity and then drive useful insights from them. Um, And so the, you know, the opportunity to work with the team at Ensemble Energy, who is trying to help basically take one of the most important growing sources of electricity generation and increase its economic efficiency by reducing economic downtime, reducing the cost of performing maintenance, I think is a really exciting opportunity and we're lucky to work with the team. That is really interesting. Does Ensemble install the sensors too, or do they just capture the data coming off the sensors? They're capturing the data that comes off of the sensors, uh, and they're able to work with most of the different OEMs, GE, et cetera. And, and, and then I'm, I'm going to assume that they provide a dashboard with the um, current reporting, so current status, and um, is there a component of AI in that where they're doing predictive also? Correct, yes. So there's a dashboard that assigns basically a health score, the different components of a wind turbine and then makes recommendations um, for when they see a problem, suggesting that, hey, there may be a problem here or a budding problem here, and a specific maintenance recommendation around, okay, I think that this this issue ultimately is because there's a uh, a lack of, let's say, lubricant in the main bearing. And so maybe, you know, these things can be quite nuanced, uh, and I'm by no means uh, a a wind engineer by any sort of imagination, but, you know, you have uh, it, you're not showing a low level of lubricant in the uh, in the main bearing, but ultimately the what you're what you're ultimately measuring in terms of volume is a mixture of uh, of the lubricant itself, and it's suspended in matrix, and so maybe you still have adequate matrix, but the, the lubricant itself has been burned up. Um, so you may need to regrease the main bearing, um, even though you might otherwise miss that failure. Um, and so they make recommendations around um, what preventative actions you might take in order to remediate that problem. This is just my curiosity, but do you know if um, the maintenance on the wind turbines is based on uh, revolutions or time or like what, what are some of the KPIs in that you may not know, but I'm just curious. I'm certainly not an expert in the, in, in the ins and outs of, of fleet operations right. of wind turbines, um, but all, all of these things play a role. Temperature and vibration in various components also are, are substantially important. So, you know, you may have a vibration reading off of the, the gearbox and a series of other components. And so there's a, 
there's a number of different uh, data sources that can be used to try to paint a picture for why you may have an impending failure. Um, and of course, it's a really interesting operational challenge for a number of asset owners as well, because these assets can be, can be quite distributed across you know, either very large swaths of land or across many states in some cases. And so uh, you know, there's, there's still a fundamental component of, in order to, you know, historically, the way that you check these things is you had to send a person in a truck, and now we can, we can use some software tools and maybe uh, shorten the, the time cycle there. Good old-fashioned truck rolls. Hey, it's, a, it's, it's still an important component of this industry. Totally agree. You know, I'm, I'm watching the entire um, field resource um, sector you know, uh, being changed or evolved with, with, with data now. I think I heard recently a statistic and this was just for regular field resources that it cost uh, anywhere between 150 to 250 dollars every time you roll a truck and so if you can have you know sensors on particular devices and you know have a dashboard that is doing predictive or yeah or uh, in real some time cases, it'll, it'll, you know, it can save a significant amount of money inspect remote assets using drones you know there's obviously an evolving regulatory framework with the faa around you know do you have to have line of sight to drones for commercial applications and you know is that uh, is that only for urban areas, or, or, is, or is it also true for rural areas? So there's there's an evolving legislative um, situation around this, but but ultimately I believe that a lot of these remote assets will be able to be at least initially inspected by drones, um, and you'll be able to sort of only deploy human capital against pro those assets where you actually have a problem. It's it's fascinating to see what the future holds. Now you mentioned this company that Ensemble that's working on wind. Are there any other energy? sources that you're looking at? You know, we're looking at the the full stack of generation solutions. And, and our strategy expands beyond just generation. Um, you know, broadly, we think of ourselves as, I want to have a, a holistic, integrated solution for the entire energy value chain. And to my perspective, that actually is about enabling the the grid to be a more efficient network. And we can, we can get into that in, in greater detail. Um, and that by, by, by doing that, I think you just enable the the, the best energy resources to, to win. Um, and, and for a variety of sort of fundamental characteristic reasons, I think that that will enable the increasing deployment of wind, solar, um, advanced nuclear. Although for a number of decades, probably into the future, I still believe that natural gas is going to necessarily be an important part of the energy mix. Um, although maybe its utilization will decline over time. Um, but that's probably a a fairly long-term road. Okay, so you said the grid. I, I would like for you to get into that a little bit more. Sure. So, you know, I, I sort of like to draw an analogy to the internet here and just sort of think about what are, we think of the grid as, as a network. It has the, the fundamental characteristics of a network, but but historically has operated quite a bit differently from, from the way that the internet does. Uh, you know, it's historically, you know, the internet is in many ways uh, inherently peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, you know, it's not a, you know, without getting into conversations around, around blockchain, you know, it's not, the internet is not fundamentally permissionless, um, but, but largely operates in a, in a relatively peer-to-peer -peer or it's relatively democratized way. Um, whereas historically the grid has been fairly hierarchical. Um, you know, there's a centralized generation resource of some kind or a series of, you know, reasonably centralized generation resources. And we use a network to distribute those. Um, and, you know, there are, and, and that's just the way that it's worked for, you know, a hundred years now, uh, you know, kind of ever, ever since we, you know, at the, at the latest, since we started out building out uh, rural electrification following the, the New Deal. Um, but that, that isn't the way it necessarily has to work. And we're starting to see the earliest signals of this today where people uh, deploy rooftop solar, let's say, um, whether that's utility scale solar for a commercial or industrial application, or it's you or I putting solar panels on our home. Um, the challenge, of course, is that it's been difficult for those resources to be economically competitive. It's not, you know, we still largely need to have a grid connection for, for most people who don't have adequate battery, battery storage. And there's a whole litany of technological and economic reasons why most people are, <laughs> are, are not yet at that point. Um, but even if I am producing excess solar in many markets, I am historically have not been legally uh, allowed to sell it back to the grid. You know, I have, or there's been some fundamental technological limitation from my utility operator that prevents me from actually sending power back onto the grid. But even if I could send power back onto the grid, um, it's often very difficult to identify what an appropriate economic price for that is. Um, so you look at you know, MIT a few years ago did a utility of the future report. And I think one of the takeaways from that report, which tends to, to shock most people when they're 
you know, not as deeply ingrained in this industry, is that it would be very difficult for a utility, and in many cases impossible, for a utility to identify what the actual value, economic value, of a marginal kilowatt hour at a particular point in time, at a particular point on the grid, should actually even be. Um, you know, these are these are problems that just computationally are very, very difficult for humans to do, certainly in real time. But now we have software tools that could could enable this. Um, and so I just, you know, as as I step back and say, okay, let's pretend like the grid is a network, like any other network, and it has certain characteristics that are that are inherent to networks. Um, there's the way that things are today, and then, but not all of those characteristics are things that necessarily have to persist into into the future, and, and some some of them inherently will. Um, you know, and I don't want to to overstretch the analogy of the internet to the grid. I think there are some inherent differences. Um, you know, in on the internet, you're, you're transmitting data, um, which in many cases now has economic value that I would argue doesn't necessarily have intrinsic economic value. Whereas energy transmission, I believe, actually does have intrinsic economic value. Um, so it's it's not identical to the internet, and so there are there are certain analogies that I think you could make that probably would would fail under inspection. But if I look at some of the the business models that have been effective online, I think that some of those also can be translated to, to the grid. And we're we're not there yet, but just to, to take a specific example, fundamentally, Uber uses a network, the internet, to match un you know under match supply and demand of, of a particular resource in the physical world. Could there be, you know, and this is probably looking decades into the future, I think there's a fair amount of technological deployment that has to, that has to happen between now and, and this place. But fundamentally, if there are certain places on the grid that are producing energy, whether it's, you know, your traditional generation suppliers, businesses that, that, that do this, or whether it's those who have solar panels on their homes or, you know, possibly other smaller scale generation technologies, uh, in principle, it is possible to deploy an algorithm that helps us match, you know, excess supply with, you know, unmet demand. You know, that that's very interesting. And I'm I'm personally becoming more and more interested in this uh, area of distributed energy resources. One of the um, examples I was given recently is that, and so I live in a community that has, let's say, 3,000 homes. But uh, what would it look like if, for example, we have a co-op as a provider, you know, if the co-op put, um, you know, smart thermostats in all the homes and we have solar panels too, then when there's excess load on the grid, the co-op could essentially lower the temperature by, you know, no understanding or knowing the patterns of our of our daily living. They could lower the temperature by a degree or two across the 2,500 homes, therefore saving the grid, you know, a percentage of what their usage would normally be. So I totally agree with you regarding the grid. I think it's a very, very interesting space. And I think it's going to, again, to your point about data, I think as we learn more and as we're able to digitize the analog, we will be able to do things that are going to be extremely creative with the grid. Absolutely. Yeah. You, I mean, you hit on demand response for which there's tremendous promise. You know, if I look back a few weeks to when the price, you know, the wholesale price of energy in Texas, uh, you know, an encore hit $9,000 a megawatt. Um, imagine if we could just have, you know, marginally moved demand a few, you know, a, a few you know, hundred, a few thousand megawatts back and get into a much more agreeable part of the price curve by, you know, increasing the, the temperature in some number of homes by a degree or two. Um, you know, how will we think about those command and control problems going forward um, and letting the discussion around you know, how much energy is utilized be sort of a two-way discussion as opposed to one-way discussion? Um, and and then ultimately, you know, is it possible in the future that maybe consumers will capture some of that some of that economic value by saying, you know, what I'm not going to demand extra energy, but I require something in return for that. I mean, it's difficult to anticipate sort of the the what will happen. I'm going back to a prior section of our conversation, but it's easy to imagine a series of things that may happen. Ab absolutely. So you know, we talked about wind. We talked about the grid a little bit. I, I want to explore more about so the why it's driving you to be interested or investing in this space what what's the motivation for you uh, there are so many things um so i guess to to get to really answer that question i think i have to start by looking back um and and, and getting into that okay you know be, being a beneficiary of, of good fortune um you know when i graduated from university i for a time thought that i wanted to work in the policy space uh, and so i landed this pro-technology uh, the way that the way that 
they articulated is eco-modernist uh, environmental policy think tank, studying the institutional arrangements around major innovations in energy generation technology. And then over the last 120-ish years, let's say from the Parsons steam turbine forward. Um, and I think the thing that initially fascinated me about that problem was, to be candid, not energy. It was that it was just such a complex problem. I mean, and first and foremost, that even in order to wrap your arms around that problem, uh, you know, the, without getting too into the weeds, the concept was, is it possible that innovations of different degrees of complexity require different types of institutional arrangements in order to, to create those innovations? Um, but in order to answer that question, you have to come up with a fairly robust definition of, well, what is complexity innovation? How do I measure complexity? Uh, and that's a really hard problem. And so initially, my, my sort of dipping my toes into this space was actually my fascination with just, okay, this is a really complex problem to define, and I like complex problems. Um, of course, through it, gained a, an appreciation for, for the importance of energy, as you know, happens when you have, I was blessed in that I was able to work this place with people that just unbelievable intellectual horsepower. I mean, you know, one of the, the senior fellows the year that I was there is a gentleman named Richard Lester, who's the chair of MIT's Department of Nuclear Engineering. So just to have access to these people um, who are really exploring the depths of the space uh, was just a tremendously inspiring, inspiring opportunity. So having moved back to Dallas and landing at this Kleiner Perkins Beck startup in the energy industry, uh, Choose Energy, which was an online marketplace for electricity and natural gas plants in the deregulated markets, a very different part of the energy industry, um, really had candidly nothing to do with my research before. Um, but was another viewpoint on, on energy and why it matters and just seeing people beginning to care more. Um, and you know, we're still at the very, I think, earliest days of this, but beginning to care more about both what their energy costs, uh, as we see sort of escalating costs associated with that in certain parts of the country, um, but also what uh, what types of generation resources were, were supplying good and the carbon intensity of it. Um, you just provided me uh, another viewpoint. And so when we, when we sold that business, sort of, taking a look back at the things that I had learned and you know, the, kind of trying to wrap your head around this very big space that is the power industry um, and realizing that ultimately this, this really matters. Um, you know, there's this whole concept of uh, just a little bit abstract, but energy services. Uh, I think Václav Smeal was the, was the author who first uh, really defined it this way, although I really could be mistaken there, um, which is, Fundamentally, heat is an energy service, right? Light is an energy service. Um, and you know, your computer being able to process an email, that's an energy service. Anything that requires electricity in order to in order to occur is an energy service. Energy services matter so deeply in a modern industrialized world. And you know, if you look at the variables that measure, you know, you sort of take an academic perspective on it, the variables that measure human thriving, whether it's access to healthcare or life expectancy or you know calories consumed, consumed in the year or what have you, uh, and you correlate them with the whole series of other variables, the one that almost uniformly is most strongly correlated with positive outcomes is, is energy access, you know, kind of kilowatt hours consumed in a year, economic development. All of these things are really, really strongly correlated with this historically. Um, and so just realizing that, you know, by accident, I had learned a little bit and, you know, cont continue to learn every day, I hope. Uh, about a space that can have a really profound impact on, on human well-being on a, on a global scale is a, is a pretty uh, sobering thing to wake up one day and realize that you've, you know, that you've basically started doing by accident. Um, and then, you know, taking a step back and saying, okay, well, how can I and you know, the, you know, really amazing team of people that I've had the benefit of working with in the past and that I've had the benefit of working with now, how can we make positive impacts um, with that? The thing that, realizes that you know one of the things that we can do is we can invest in the early stage entrepreneurs who are trying to improve all of these things in the space um, and so it's it's a pretty exciting opportunity to be able to wake up in the morning and, and have a mission you know it, it sounds like your your why is tied back to your luck and serendipity and so teeing off on that um, if there's one piece of advice that you'd like to share with the audience what would it be uh, you know it's difficult <laughs> it's difficult to pick one thing I would say, but so I'm going to, I'm going to sort of key in on, I think maybe, maybe two here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and hopefully even some of them will be, uh, will be pretty good. Um, Feel free to do as many as you want. So first is, you know, and, and then I think this kind of dovetails back into a conversation we had earlier, which is it's a really complex world and there's so much that we, we don't just not know, but there's so much that's actually unknowable in advance. Um, 
And so, you know, I, I'm a big believer that we live in a probabilistic world and that you can choose certain things to optimize your odds of getting a certain result. And, and ultimately, that's, that's what we're trying to do uh, is optimize the odds of getting to a, you know, more reliable, resilient, efficient, affordable global energy infrastructure. And we're doing our small part and there's many other incredibly accomplished, talented people working on the same thing. Um, but, but I can't control all of the outcomes in, in an absolute sense. Uh, and so I think it's really important to just bring humility to your work, whatever, whatever your work may be. Um, you know, the way that, that that manifests, you know, just to give a concrete example in you know, my day to day job is uh, our process involves scoring the, our certainty that we've evaluated risks correctly. So we have a series of different categories of risk um, that we score those risks. You know, how, is there a regulatory risk? And if so, you know, how, how substantial is it? One to 10. But then there's also a question of, of certainty. You know, how sure am I that I understood this particular risk correctly? Um, is it possible that I, that I missed something here or that the world will turn out a different way than I think is the most reasonable way? And we've decided as a, as a firm and as a set of partners that certainty can never be 100% for all of those things. Um, and just because I think absolute certainty about the future is impossible. And so, you know, that just helps <laughs> bring, I think, a little bit of humility to, to my work. And that's something that I would encourage everyone to do. Um, you know, I, I don't have a, a magic crystal ball. I always joke that, uh, that if an entrepreneur comes to me with a, with a crystal ball company that will let me see the future, we're very likely to invest in that, even if it's a little outside the pieces. Um, and then, you know, I think the, the second piece of advice that I would give, uh, it's one I give regularly, is um, I really wish that this weren't the case. Um, and maybe it's not in, in every industry, but it seems to be a competitive advantage to just be a nice person. Um, you know, and I think that a lot of people kind of overlook that because it seems so rudimentary, but it's completely in your control. And I really think that a lot of, you know, a lot of life is really just showing up, following up and being nice. Um, and, you know, I think we kind of came to this conclusion that maybe it's not as common as one, <laughs> one might hope because occasionally I'm, you know, I'm very humble because we, you know, if you receive thank you, that's from people, uh, when all we do is just respond and try to treat them with, with dignity, you know, it's an unfortunate aspect of, of our business that we invest in early stage companies. And, and uh, we are like any other firms in the respect that, you know, we say no, literally a little bit over 99% of the time, um, and so when you say no and treat someone with dignity, and, and that seems like a really small thing, but then people come back to you with just tremendous gratitude for having done that. Uh, I think that's incredibly, uh, incredibly humbling. And so, you know, my, my fondest hope is that uh, the advantage of being nice erodes over time as we you know, all become a little bit nicer as a, as a civilization. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's an important part of the work is just, uh, you know, paying it forward with your kindness, but that you can go a really, really long way by just being a nice person. Well, I think that's excellent advice. Humility and being nice or being kind. Yesterday, I saw a T-shirt that said, kind people are my kind of people. I love it. So I guess that would be a great place to end it. Jonathan, thank you again so much for your time. And I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation.